Responsibility, that would appear to be the new slogan with regards to global response to COVID-19 pandemic. It, it marks a shift from the initial response strategy, which conferred enormous responsibility in governments and institutions to contain spread of the virus. Now, when the virus invaded Nigeria through the Italian, the Nigerian government swiftly responded by assembling a dedicated interagency response team, chaired by the Secretary to the Government of the Federation and coordinated by one of Africa's best infectious diseases expert. Now, the initial preventive protocols were meant to address the virus from a public health perspective. It was hoped, and I stand to be corrected, that by washing hands with soap and water or use of alcohol-based sanitizer, restricting movement and social gathering, observing two meters physical distancing would help to contain and perhaps limit spread of the virus within the metropolitan cities. But as it turned out, like a bolt out of the blue, the virus slipped into states and communities, spiking up confirmed cases and unfortunately, deaths. As isolation centers become overwhelmed, people either turned to self-medication or sought remedy in local roots and herbs in the face of no known cure or vaccine. Yet there are those who are still in denial of the pandemic, surprisingly, even among the elites. The PTF kicked in its ultimate joker in the park total lockdown and curfew. Now, some states followed suit, others sustained relaxed measures. But the people groaned under the weight of economic hardship, compelling a review of strategy. Now, that culminated in the second phase of national response to COVID-19. Protocols are gradually being relaxed and lifted, and economy is being opened. Now, the strategy this time is conferring a responsibility on states and individuals to take action. But the global perception about the COVID-19 case data emanating from Africa, especially Nigeria, is that we might not be getting the full picture of the uh, pandemic. So on late edition this week, we will interrogate the preventive protocols and ask, are we downplaying or overhyping the coronavirus pandemic in Nigeria? I am Claire Adilapu Abdurazak. Thank you for joining me. Dr. Ali Usani is an infectious disease specialist. He was the Director General of Nigeria's National Agency for the Control of AIDS, NACA. Dr. Sani was a senior hospital consultant in Cambridge University Hospital for over 10 years, becoming a consultant in microbiology and infectious diseases at the same Cambridge University uh, United in the United Kingdom. Now, Dr. Sani obtained his Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, uh, MBBS, from Ahmedou Bili University, Zaria, here in Nigeria, and that was in 1993, before proceeding to the United Kingdom for his postgraduate studies. He worked briefly as a consultant microbiologist in Birmingham, again before his appointment as the first consultant in infectious diseases and medical microbiology at the Cambridge University. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK and the Royal College of 
pathologist. He is an associate lecturer at the Cambridge University where he chairs an exam board responsible for delivery of infectious disease exams for trainees in the UK. Dr. Sani Aliyu was also honored by the United States government for leading the highest HIV AIDS indicator an impact-specific survey in the world. He is a recipient of an excellent and service award, and that's in recognition of his commitment and dedication to public health here in Nigeria. And with the rise of global COVID-19 pandemic, President Mahmoud Bari appointed Dr. Sani Aliu as the national coordinator of the Presidential Tax Force for the Control of Coronavirus in Nigeria. My second guest, joining me live via Skype from Maryland in the United States of America is Simon Magaji Agwale. He's a virologist and vaccinologist and has been in the vanguard for vaccine development worldwide. It's a mission which has earned him global reputation, especially with regards to his involvement with development of HIV vaccines. Now, should I also point out that his vision is to develop HIV vaccine constructs from prevalent Nigerian strain. He was quite instrumental, and I'm sure most of us know this, in the establishment of the first molecular evidence of HIV-2 in Nigeria, and is working on developing a manufacturing process for conjugate typhoid vaccine, which has a potential for eradicating typhoid fever. Currently, Dr. Simon Aguali is also working on the development of a novel vaccine for Ebola, cervical cancer, and COVID-19, using innovative viral-like particles Dr. Gwale has over 20 years of research experience at various institutions around the world, but also combining routine work at his biotech company, both here in Nigeria and the U.S. Dr. Gwale has represented Nigeria and Africa at different high-level interactions on vaccine development and management. He's currently head of Africa COVID-19 tax team of African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative, AVMI. Dr. Simon Agwali joins me via Skype from Maryland in the United States. So gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Let me first of all welcome your coordinator. Thank you once again for finding time to join me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me, Claire. Right. And Dr. Simon Aguali, I want to really appreciate your time. Uh, I know it's quite early in the U.S. now. Thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you for having me. All right, let me begin uh, with um, the national coordinator, Dr. Ali, Ali here with me. I, and I want to start with a general question. Where are we exactly on the flattening curve? Are we out of the woods? Is the worst yet to come, or are we overhyping the pandemic? Oh, we are definitely not overhyping the pandemic, um, Claire. Um, if anything, we we are going to the exponential phase of the pandemic. Um, as you know, we crossed um, the eleven thousand mark a few days ago, and um, at the moment, we have been increasing the number of tests we are doing. And the more you test, the more you will find. Um, a few days ago, for the first time, we tested for, uh, close to 4,000 um, samples in a single day. And our target has always been um, to get up to 4,500 per day. Um, so we are really very close to our target of um, uh, um, getting more and more tests done. The positivity rate remains fairly the same. It's about 15%. So if you translate that, if 15% of all the tests we are doing will be positive, then definitely the numbers will continue to go up. But of course, it's not just about the numbers, it's also about the severity of the illness. And uh, I think so far we've been uh, lucky in Nigeria. The case fatality rate has been about 3%. So um, on average, it means um, about 97% will, will be surviving the illness, which is very similar to what was found in, in certain parts of the world, but definitely better than what we've seen in the US and uh, the UK and particularly Italy, where the mortality rates have been much higher. You could argue that maybe, maybe we're not recording all the deaths. Um, uh, it's quite possible there might be people dying at home, for instance, that haven't come out to be tested uh, for COVID. Mm. Um, that's still a possibility. It's also possible that um, a lot of the deaths that we are seeing are indirectly linked to COVID. Because as you know, with COVID, um, a lot of health institutions, health facilities have sort of stepped down their routine clinical work. Um, certainly we know the teaching hospitals like in Kano, for instance, it's only recently that they've restarted their outpatient clinics. Mm. So people are finding it more difficult and challenging to, to access healthcare services in the absence of, uh, in, 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 even if, if they don't have COVID um, at all. Mm. But yes, the numbers are there and um, 
Um, I'm so very surprised that people remain cynical about COVID. We've just done a survey, 13% of Lagosians in the survey did not believe that COVID exists, oh. even though even though Lagos is the epicenter mm. of the epidemic in Nigeria. Okay, so so you, you would agree that um, the data we're getting really, um, I mean, doesn't give us the real picture, you know, of what we're dealing with. It doesn't give oh, us. The oh, real we picture. we definitely uh, we have improved in terms of testing because if you look at it, we had less than five laboratories uh, when we when the PTF started that were providing testing for COVID. We now have about 30, 29, 30. Um, the numbers have increased in terms of testing, but per capita in terms of our population, we're still under testing compared to other parts of the world and Africa as well. Could be worse. Oh, of course, it could be. Yes, uh, uh, almost, certainly, almost certainly we have a lot more than 11,000 persons um, infected with COVID in Nigeria. Okay, let, let me, let me uh, go to Dr. Simon Aguale uh, in, in Maryland. Uh, Dr. Aguale, going by the data that we, we have, do you think that um, uh, have we contained or are we delaying or are we dodging the COVID-19 bullet? Well, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to make this very important contribution. Uh, you know, like uh, the chairman said, uh, the case fatality rate is, is just about 3%, which is great news. So uh, we need to, you know, embark on research to find out why uh, the case fatality in Nigeria is, is this low compared to what we are seeing here in the US, UK and, and other places. So uh, as part of the strategy, uh, I think that we should include research uh, because there are a lot of things that are unknown as far as this virus is concerned. Uh, the, uh, why are we having this low uh, case fatality in Nigeria? These are questions that need to be addressed. If you carry out uh, a systematic research, I believe that uh, the answers will help the rest of the world uh, to manage their situations as well. Now, if you uh, look at recent data, for example, you will find out that uh, there's cross reactivity between um, COVID. Uh, I mean, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 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 so it's possible that uh, because of our exposure to other coronaviruses, uh, we probably uh, have a, a kind of a immune response that, that we make the uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, you know, uh, less uh, pathogenic. So these are questions that, that need answers. So whatever intervention that we're embarking on now, uh, we need to bring in research to begin to address some of these issues. I'd just like you again, just in form of summary of what you said, um, how would you evaluate our progress? Well, I think uh, in terms of testing, uh, we're not there yet. The, uh, I mean, a population of 200 uh, million people um, we have basically from what I've been reading, uh, just about 20,000 people uh, have been tested. Uh, that is very, very low. And, and, and the, the test that we, we, we use in Nigeria, which is the TCR, uh, is basically the gold standard. But there's no way that uh, you can uh, achieve the numbers, projected numbers that we have without getting tests like rapid test kits uh, uh, into uh, the program. Of course, I know I've been involved uh, and currently involved in, in rapid test uh, uh, kits, uh, which you know you use and you get results in 10 minutes. That's basically what we use for HIV, hepatitis, and other infectious diseases. I know there are a lot of junk uh, out there, but this is the reason why I said that whatever intervention that we're embarking on, we have to bring research in. We have a lot of uh, COVID-19 patients already in Nigeria. We have samples that are positive, well tested, we know they are positive, and then we have well characterized samples that, that, that are negative. So what stops us from carrying out our own evaluation? If you have a test kit, evaluate. 
you know, uh, is this, what is the correlation between uh, this test and the gold standard that we have? And then you adopt it and rapidly uh, increase the, the testing capacity. You deploy these things. You don't need any equipment to rural areas. Uh, anybody that comes there, they get their results in 10 minutes. Uh, those people are isolated, contact tracing, and so on. So I think the test that we have now is the best, is the gold standard, but we need to introduce rapid testing so that we can increase the number of tests uh, 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 people that are uh, tested. So, I mean, tested so that they can be quickly uh, uh, isolated and then uh, 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 contact testing uh, 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 commence. Dr. Sonia Ali, I, I did say at the beginning of the program that at the outset, the strategy, as someone told us, was based was you know on public health perspective. Is that still the case? So to a large extent, that is still the case. Um, so um, as, as you know, we've now moved to the second phase of our response um, because what we are trying to do is to 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 balance uh, li lives with livelihoods. Um, as you know, we. We, we locked down parts of the country uh, for about five weeks. Um, we extended that to Kano uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, we know that it's very difficult in a developing country setup to ask people to stay at home because and the majority of the populace uh, will need to go out to seek their daily food. But at the same time, we don't want this pandemic to, to progress and we end up in a, in a difficult situation with a lot of people dying. So what the approach that we have now taken is, is a very pragmatic approach where we are working on flattening the curve, reducing the number of new infections that are happening uh, by making sure that people follow the usual guidelines that we have provided and that you've mentioned earlier on hand washing, the use of face masks, um, physical distancing, etc. while at the same time trying to push the message across to the communities that this is all about personal responsibility. Um, we know from the surveys that we have done that um, an incredible number of people don't even believe COVID exists. Those that do believe COVID exists believe that they are immune to it, that somehow it's not going to affect them or because they are in Africa or the climate, etc. It's a mild illness and therefore it's not their problem. So that community engagement, that risk communication component is so critical. It's so critical. In addition to that, it's quite obvious that the distribution, the prevalence of COVID across the country is not uniform. We have about 20 local governments um, ranging from Kano, um, Lagos, um, parts of the FCT, um, Edo, Bauchi, I believe, and uh, possibly Jigawa, um, constitute about 60% of all the infections we have. And therefore, we are concentrating on those local governments as well, what we call precision targeting. Uh, looking at a combination of measures within those local governments. So, for instance, increasing surveillance and testing, um, doing massive community testing within those areas, uh, making sure that isolation facilities are made available, community isolation facilities, uh, making sure that the management, the case management side, they have good hospitals close to those areas that can this manage. next phase or this it's, it's, it's the current phase that we are in. Okay. It's the current this phase current that we are phase in. Now. Yes. This second phase. This second phase. Let, let, me, let me just, you know, uh, uh, hold you on that and do a little bit of analysis of impact in the first phase because, again, that's probably determined, you know, the, the this second phase, the strategy adopted in this second phase. Let's look at the, the protocols first. Let's begin with the lockdown. Mm. It's, it's a containment strategy. I've heard some experts say, look, people, you know, do lockdown for different objectives. Yes. Yes, you know, and, and they differ from country uh, to country. So what are the indicators, you know, saying about our own implementation of the lockdown as a preventive measure? So uh, we, we have looked at the... At the the performance, how well we did with the lockdown, mm. because the question really is, was it effective? Did people stay at home when we expected them to stay at home? So we have um, a large um, body of uh, research people behind us within the PTF that provide us with data on modeling, that provide us with mobility data, that um, look at the literature in great detail, because uh, even though some of us can do that, but, mm -hmm. but we don't really have the time to spend uh, on and going into great detail. But what we do know from, from lockdowns is it's the most effective intervention when it comes to cutting transmission. It's the most effective intervention. It reduces the number of new infections by 45%. And the only other thing that gives you a fairly good 
measure is closing schools. The school closure reduces um, transmission by about 15%. All the other interventions, hand washing, mask wearing, physical distancing, etc., is between 5 to 7%. It's relatively small, but it's when you combine them together. When you combine those other measures, then they tend to be equivalent to a lockdown because by the time you, you physically distance yourself, you, you wash your hands, you use a face mask, um, you avoid mass gatherings, it's no different to staying at home. So those measures are combined are very similar to a lockdown, which was why we moved away from the lockdown, because we could see the impact it was having on our economy. We could see the impact it was having on people's uh, socioeconomic, um, um, the socioeconomic survival. Um, it was getting incredibly more and more difficult to convince people to stay at home. Mm. But even with the lockdown, the reduction in movement in Lagos and Abuja, and we have the mobility data to show it, um, a movement went down by about 55 percent mm. and surprisingly even after we lifted the lockdown because we maintained the curfew because we had restricted the number of uh, civil servants coming into only grade level 14 and above the change in traffic in abuja was barely it was barely 15 percent difference mm. really people continue to stay at home to mm. a large extent mm. which, which which is a good thing mm -hmm. and because we know we were in the early stages of the pandemic and what we wanted was to slow it down. And by the time we reached the second phase, we could demonstrate quite clearly that the Dublin time, usually the Dublin time for the epidemic, if you don't do anything, is between every four to five days, mm -hmm. the, the numbers will double. The main objective was to allow for the health institutions uh, to, to, cope. to be better prepared. Yes, to cope, to prepare. Are, mm. are we better prepared now? We are better prepared in terms of the beds that we have. We have over 6,000 beds um, that we've uh, created as a result of COVID. Of course, they are still insufficient. Um, states like Lagos and Kano, for instance, um, uh, they are fast running out of bed capacity. Increasingly, more and more persons that are positive are now having to stay at home because there are no beds to accommodate them. But at the same time, if you look across the country, um, uh, we have 20, 21 uh, percent occup occupancy. So some states still have beds that are unused and some states have been overwhelmed. So as I said, the epidemic itself is, is quite a mixed, mixed uh, heterogeneous pandemic across the country. The interstate travel ban aspect of the protocol, I mean, we all know that it's, it's probably the weakest link in the whole measure. So why did we have to sustain it? So, uh, Claire, why do you say weakest link? Yeah, um, because, every, because people are moving, people are traveling, and, and community spread, community spread is, is, is spiking up. Yes, so, so what, what, what was our aim in terms of uh, interstate, restricting interstate mm -hmm. travel? What we know is if a, a state is adjacent to a very high prevalence state. So, for instance, Kaduna is very close to Kano, isn't it? Bauchi, we could see the spillover effect of Kano into Bauchi parts of um, Bauchi like Azari, etc., mm. uh, had a significant number of infections, partly because of the movement between Kanu and uh, Bauchi. And at the same time, Kaduna, one of the reasons why the Kaduna numbers are, are, are relatively low compared to Kanu mm. is because of that restriction in movement. Yes, people are still breaching those rules, but at the end of the day, we still don't have 100% free movement between, between the states. So there's still a level of restriction. And what we wanted to do really was to make sure that those hotspots remain as they are. The fire does not go beyond that particular locality because it's easier for us as a country to fight the small fires, the hotspots that are across the country, than to allow everything to rage and then we'll have a situation where we'll not be able to get on top of it. Uh, uh, Dr. Gwale, I'd just like you to also respond. And I know you have um, you know, mentioned research as a, as a big gap. Uh, and all that. We will speak to what we're doing in terms of uh, uh, capacity for research, but w w how do you evaluate uh, protocols, you know, implementation of our protocols, lockdown, interstate restriction, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what other African countries, you know, are, you know, implementing? Well, I mean, the, uh, this is standard practice, the lockdown, uh, the standard practice globally, you know, and, and then even here in the U.S., we're, we're locked down for uh, a couple of months, and then the uh, things are beginning to ease out now because the uh, CDC came up with uh, uh, protocols for easing uh, some of this lockdown. Some states are already in uh, phase two, 
uh, now you have saloons and, and uh, you know restaurants and, and so uh, opening up. Uh, a standard practice, global practice, that is because you don't. I mean, this is a new virus. You don't know how it's uh, everything about the virus, how it's transmitted, and so on. So the first thing to do is to lock down. So now uh, we basically now understand uh, uh, some things about the virus. For example, we know that the elderly people are at risk. Uh, so what most countries are doing, Ireland and other parts of, of the world, is to protect the elderly because they are the ones that are dying. Now, uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, if you have uh, a very good health system, uh, those that are infected are isolated and then they are treated. So that's all you need. And then you begin to ease out uh, the, uh, the lockdown. So they open up the economy because people are dying. I mean, here in the U.S., for example, uh, 40 million people, over 40 million people have lost their job. There was the good news that uh, at least uh, 2.8 million people uh, were, were employed, uh, which is great news. So the economy is beginning to pick up. So if you look at the consequences of locking down an economy, and then the impact of that lockdown <laughs> and, and the number of people that will be affected as a result of the lockdown, uh, you find out that it's better to uh, you know, begin to ease uh, the lockdown and put certain measures in place. I mean, uh, washing of hands, uh, wearing of uh, uh, masks, uh, uh, social distancing. These are critical things that uh, needs to be uh, embraced until we have a vaccine. All right, Dr. Simon Aguale, thank you. Um, let's just take a short break. Uh, when we come back, we'll look at, um, you know, efforts to uh, develop a vaccine and, of course, uh, uh, what might characterize Nigeria's, uh, uh, you know, response in this next phase or in the next phase at the end of uh, June, the month of June. We'll be right back. There is a lot of fake news and report circulating, especially on social media, on the coronavirus. Do not believe or partake in the spread of these fake reports. If it is not on the official website or news from the Nigerian Center for Disease Control and CDC, disregard such report. Only together can we beat this virus. Only together can we overcome this pandemic. Follow the instructions and guidelines provided to combat this virus. Most importantly, stay at home self-isolate regardless of your status the virus doesn't move unless we move let us work together to better nigeria together we can do this this message is brought to you by the nigerian television authority nta africa's largest television network All right, welcome back. This is late edition, and today we're this week we're looking at Nigeria's uh, national response to COVID-19 in the second phase. And I have with me the national coordinator of uh, Presidential Tax Force team on COVID-19, Dr. Uh, Ali Usani, who is right here with me in the studio, and of course with Dr. Simon Aguali joining us via Skype from Maryland in the United States. Gentlemen, once again, thank you. Let me uh, begin with you, uh, Dr. Simon Aguali. You talked about antibody testing. Uh, Senegal, just close to us here, uh, is set to be the least, you know, COVID-19 impacted country in, in, in the sub-region. Uh, and um, th this is because uh, one of the medical experts did say, uh, and I like to quote, he said, it, it's a simple test. You know, they have adopted a test, which I understand it's um, like a pregnancy-like test, uh, which requires that you drop a blood or saliva onto devices, and of course you get the result in just two hours. And one of the medical, you know, experts said it's a simple test that can be done anywhere. You know, it's you don't need uh, a highly equipped test. Is that the same thing as what you're telling us is happening in uh, in the UK or in the US? That's basically what I'm saying. The, there are two ways to measure antibody testing. Uh, advanced countries, because of the resources that they have, 
uh, they can be sophisticated, which is the ELISA technique. Uh, you know, several universities have developed that. And then uh, even here in the U.S., with the advancement, we, they still use the rapid test because we get results in 10 minutes. Everything is about evaluation. Now, this is the same test that is being used in Nigeria for HIV tests. You know, you use two rapid test kits. Uh, that is the algorithm that we have uh, in Nigeria. That's the test for hepatitis that we have in Nigeria. So the rapid test kit is just a drop of blood and the buffer, and you get result in 10 minutes. So that's basically what uh, Senegal uh, is using. Uh, there's no doubt, there's a lot of junk out there. But the, the, the key thing is that uh, we have, uh, for example, in Lagos, uh, I know the commissioner there, I know him personally, great scientists, internationally recognized. They keep samples of all the positive cases. So now, like I said, PCR, which is detection of the uh, uh, virus, uh, is the gold standard. But it's difficult to scale up. <laughs> you know, it requires equipment, you know, training and so on. Rapid tests can be done even at primary healthcare uh, uh, settings. Uh, which will enable you to rapidly. And that's why uh, Seneca is getting the kind of results they are getting. Because, uh, I mean, somebody comes, within 10 minutes, you get your results. Uh, if that person is infected, it's isolated, and so on. So, you know, you can come up with uh, a protocol that you can use that platform uh, to rapidly screen. And those that are positive, you can send the samples uh, for confirmation, I mean, uh, using the uh, PCR. But if we depend only on PCR, I've been involved in, uh, as you know, uh, PCR, I've, I've developed primers, I've developed tests uh, in the past. I know how complicated this can be. Uh, it's subject to contamination, so many other issues around that. So I think that we should quickly and rapidly embrace the rapid test but not embracing everything, evaluate. Let, let me bring in uh, the coordinator here because I know that uh, he has his own views also about this rapid test uh, thing. Uh, thank you. So I, I'm glad uh, Dr. Simon actually mentioned the problem. The problem is there are so many rapid test kits that are dodgy out there. And um, even when you look at certain countries like the UK and Monaco, for instance, they spent a lot of money to, to get test kits evaluated. But the UK test kit that they worked on gave a sensitivity of 60% compared to the, the gold standard. So these were people that were already positive confirmed on PCR, and then they do the same test. And only in six out of 10 cases will they pick up a positive. So that performance, so far at the moment, the performance of the rapid test kits is not good enough to be used for diagnostic purposes. But we know that there are developments going on in the field. It's, it almost certainly would be the situation in the coming weeks to months that there will be better rapid test kits coming in. But certainly we will not put uh, a large amount of our resources that are already limited to, uh, to use test kits at the moment in Nigeria for diagnostic purposes when we know that they do not perform well. Be beyond that, what would you also consider, you know, as a threat to our national response? Uh, some people have talked about uh, probable shortage of, you know, uh, medicines you know, for, for treatment. And uh, maybe because uh, uh, most of what we have, you know, we outsource from other countries. Uh, and because of the lockdown and all that, you know, the restriction of movement, you know, that is affecting our response. So there's no doubt COVID, what COVID has done is it has impacted on the other non-COVID health conditions, particularly the non-communicable diseases, okay. etc. So for instance, if you have diabetes and you need insulin, for example, it's not that easy getting insulin in a lockdown situation. Uh, if you are hypertensive, you need your antihypertensive drugs, etc. It's less of a problem with COVID specifically, because with COVID, there's no treatment that works. It's all supportive. Uh, you, you have a cough, you, you're given cough syrup. You have a temperature, you have paracetamol. Or body aches, you have aspirin. Or if you need oxygen, 
you get oxygen. If you have a secondary infection with pneumonia, you get antibiotics. So but there's so no specific... are treated based on the symptoms uh, thank you. Yes, it's supportive treatment. There is no specific treatment at the moment for COVID that has been demonstrably shown to work. None. There are, there are studies that are going on, supported by WHO and other mm -hmm. academic centers, uh, which gradually, <laughs> progressively, are putting aside some, a, lot of the, a lot of the current treatments that people have been banding around, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, the HIV drug, lopinavir, retronavir, etc. They, they are gradually not showing the sort of impact that we expect. I'm glad mm -hmm. you've brought in the aspect of you know, research and what we're doing locally. And then I'll, I'll, I'll throw the ball to uh, the court of uh, Dr. Gwali because uh, he is head of uh, the you know Africa's tax team to develop vaccine. Uh, Dr. Gwali, how far, uh, how, how near are we, you know, in Africa to developing a vaccine for COVID-19? Well, uh, we are not sure about the tax team to make sure that COVID-19 vaccine is manufactured in Africa. Now, if you look at what is happening globally, uh, we have more than 120 candidate vaccines. They are candidates because they are not yet licensed, uh, you know, as vaccines. And, and, and none of this vaccine uh, is being developed uh, in, in Africa. So the strategy, the initial strategy is uh, to assess, because we have a couple of vaccine manufacturers in Nigeria, and, and the only two countries that, that have the cap uh, capacity at least to do the fill and finish are South Africa and Senegal. Senegal basically uh, is making only yellow fever vaccine. South African capacity uh, is just fill and finish for uh, other companies. So we had a teleconference on Thursday. And, and they said to me that uh, even if we have a COVID vaccine today, uh, the capacity that they have is not going to be enough to uh, even vaccinate uh, 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 South Africans, you know. So there's an immediate need uh, for, for us to, to think about uh, uh, quickly building vaccine manufacturing capability. Don't think that if we have a vaccine tomorrow, you will have access to it in Nigeria uh, overnight. It doesn't work that way. See what is happening in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government has given uh, AstraZeneca, for example, $1.2 billion uh, uh, advanced commitments uh, and saying that give us at least 300 million doses of the vaccine. It's never been done to see a government pay in advance before you know whether the vaccine will work or not. Because they know that if we know today that the vaccine works, uh, the production of the vaccine uh, may not give you the numbers that you will need to vaccinate your people. So they it's taking the risks to begin to produce these vaccines in advance to, uh, before you even know whether the vaccine will work or not. Now they are investing in so many other companies, AstraZeneca, $1.2 billion, Moderna, uh, which the clinical trial was, uh, a phase one clinical trial was released uh, 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 two to three weeks ago. Uh, excellent data because the people that took the vaccines had antibodies that neutralized the virus. So we know basically that uh, eventually we have a COVID-19 vaccine because people, a lot of people that get the infection recover from it. So we know what the correlates of protection are. We have candidate vaccines that have been shown in clinical trials to induce the right immune response that will protect against the COVID-19 vaccine. So we need to now start talking about how we can access these vaccines. You know, you hear stories about, I'm not going to take the vaccines, and most of these studies, uh, things are coming from Nigeria. I think the right question is, how can we have access to the vaccines whenever it's developed? You know, so I think that the part of the strategy should be deliberate effort, you know, to build uh, the necessary capacity in Nigeria where we can manufacture the vaccines, even if we're not developing now, if let's say one of the companies vaccine becomes successful, we should be able to immediately license that product and produce it locally for our people. If not, 
uh, you have to wait for years and see the number of people that, that, that they are going to lose. Let me just hold, put you on hold. Uh, the national coordinator is here. Uh, fortunately, both of you are infectious diseases um, uh, expert. So what is our research community doing with regards to not just keying into the you know, efforts to find a vaccine, but also to grow local solution to COVID-19? So um, I agree with um, uh, Simon. Uh, there's no doubt that the final solution to the COVID pandemic is having an effective vaccine. And there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, all the measures that we are putting in place now is to, to allow us to survive, to delay until such a time that either we get a vaccine or we develop herd immunity uh, at a population level and therefore the number of inf infections come, come down. So in other words, it's now a survival game. How do, how do we get to next year? But the issue is vaccines are not going to be uh, to, to be available immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's why the PTF, remember the Presidential Task Force is a committee. We are not an agency. We, we, we are there as a fin start and finish task group, as Mr. Okay. President clearly mm -hmm. elucidated. So our job is to make sure in the short term we are able to deal with this problem and at the same time enable build the building of bridges across different sectors so that we can support the country moving forward to make sure that post-pandemic mm -hmm. we have a very good plan. From the research side, we are encouraging researchers. We have a very small budget. Our budget is primarily in terms of research to enable academicians to be able to write grants, to apply for grants, and to be able to set up the initial process of um, doing research. It is not for the purpose of, let's say, developing a vaccine. But what we can do, just like Simon said, is to link researchers with the right people. people. So for instance, the CBN, to say, okay, or the private sector. The private sector is a very good example, CACOVID, uh, for instance, they have a group of researchers that they are currently supporting. Because vaccine, uh, vaccine manufacture is, is, is big business. It's, it's, it's not something that requires a small amount of money. Mm. I absolutely agree that we need, we need to have good manufacturing plants in Nigeria. But when you look at it, Years back, Nigeria was producing its own vaccines, but um, the center that was producing vaccines is in Lagos. What sort of situation is it in? Mm -hmm. So those are the sort of things that we need to address, the chronic underfunding over many years of not only research, but also mm -hmm. the, health, the health system in itself, which I, I'm glad to say uh, people are now coming around to understanding that um, when societies develop, it's not just about the infrastructure, it's also about investing in health and investing in education and investing in your people because that's what will push the economy to move, that's what will enable the country to develop. Mm. Uh, Doug, uh, uh, some people have come out or with claims you know to have developed or found a particular cure you know usually a herbal cure or, or, or that but I, I'm concerned about the support, you know, and the opportunities that policies, you know, have given to this class of people to either validate or, you know, you know, I mean, validate their claims and, and all that. It would appear that some of those, you know, policies are, are just um, what I would call a hedge and a wedge. You know, for instance, you, you need a whole 1.5 million to, to validate your claims. You know, they can. So, isn't that big, big, big money for some of those people? So, uh, so uh, Claire, the thing is, we cannot mix the two. We can, you cannot mix uh, modern science, modern medicine, okay, mm. with other um, um, your street, your street, um, yes, yes, <laughs> your yes. street medicine man yes. who, who who may have something that he claims. But we can, works, we okay? can give we can give them so, an opportunity uh, to validate. Uh, yes, but that that validation. I keep on saying this, and I hope I'm not sounding like a broken record, but if you have a headache now, what would you do? What would you go and get? <laughs> Paracetamol. What, what oh, oh, people, no, 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 what, let me finish. So you, what, if you have a headache, what would you go and get? Paracetamol. Why do you, don't, why do you have... Be, don't be too sure about yeah, that. Well, okay, but whatever you get, why are you so confident? that that medicine would work. Because you don't have the time to start going around and asking the local person. You would prefer something that works, don't you? Well, the reason why you have that confidence in the drug working is because it has gone through a validated process. 
we get a lot of letters through the PTF uh, mm -hmm. claiming that uh, this drug works, this drug works, but it's not the job of the PTF to validate it. There are established processes there are established ways of defining whether a drug works because sometimes it's not just about the drug working. Take chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, for instance. Even if it works for COVID, if the side effects of the drug is more than that of um, curing COVID, then it wouldn't be licensed. It, you have to have that balance. For an infection like COVID, where 80% where have mild symptoms, where even in the cohort in China, 92% fully recovered without any side effect. Even if you were to take something, let's say you take water or you take goro, for instance, the probability is that unless you fall within that risk group of severe <laughs> illness, the probability is that you will get better. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that was the drug that got you better. So people should follow the right process. If you think that you have a drug that works for COVID, go through the necessary steps to validate it. Is there, is there hope for those who actually have come up with such claims? Well, it should be, they should go through the process and see whether it works. It's not a case of hope. It is a case of evidence. The, yes, that's, 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 that's my question. Hmm? The processes, does that, the, the processes give them room? Does it give them the laxity to actually, you know, uh, access? The, the processes are there for a reason, and I am confident that the processes <laughs> do work. Okay, I'll just, I, I've exceeded my time, but I, I'll just, I have two very questions I'd like to ask briefly. One to Dr. Gwale and the last one to Dr. Aliu here. Dr. Gwale, in terms of development in our healthcare system, what do you think, briefly please, uh, COVID-19 has managed to do positively for us, I mean, Nigeria? Well, I mean, if, if I understood it very well, I think we should use this opportunity to uh, build our, you know, healthcare system. And uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Liu, uh, you know, uh, some of these helps, uh, claims and, and so on, uh, they need to go through a uh, validation process. Uh, I mean, NIPRIC is there. Uh, if you have anything, you take it there for, uh, the, you know, for evaluation. I remember I was at NIPRIT uh, during the HIV, uh, uh, you know, uh, story, and uh, all the people that said they had one cure or the other, and so on, the government gave some money, and then NIPRIT evaluated uh, those, and none came out as a treatment for uh, HIV. So you cannot make a claim that if it has not been validated. You can't say, I can cure COVID-19. Uh, with my uh, this, where's the data? You know, everything boils to data. So without uh, data, and they can't generate the data. So if you think you have something, you go to the appropriate uh, uh, agency or institutions that will be able to validate that and tell you whether your product works or not. Okay, Dr. Gwali, thank you. And um, someone, someone sent me a question uh, by, by text, by WhatsApp, uh, Tayo in Lagos. And this question she wants me to ask the uh, PTF coordinator. She says, in view of the easing of the lockdown, what plans does the PTA have for the vulnerable and those at risk, such as um, diabetics or with other conditions who still have to work? That's one. Then she wants to know the guidelines for schools reopening, especially public schools, where some of the classes are about 50, have about 50 children. How can social distancing be implemented? So I'll start with the second question, which has to do with school closure. One of the reasons why uh, we have been very cautious about opening schools is because the evidence base it's very clear that um, transmission does happen in school environments. And we also know that it's more difficult to get young children to understand the importance of hand washing and maintaining physical distancing, etc. And more importantly, children are more likely to be asymptomatic and still transmit the infection. So you'll find children carrying the infection from their schools to their elderly uh, grandparents and their elderly grandparents um, suffer, suffering from severe illness. So that's why we've been very careful. But um, it's possible. You can see from the UK, for instance, where um, my, my, my kids are just about, their schools have just opened. And what they did was they, they asked the parents whether or not they were comfortable allowing their children to come to school so that they reduced the, the capacity. 
um, and they only allowed the last year, so the year six, six um, for the primary school, because they were about to graduate and move on to secondary school. So they allowed them to come in. They maintained physical distance in terms of the furniture, etc. There was a lot of hand washing. At the end of every lesson, they will go around and gel. They measure the temperature of the children three times a day in the morning, around lunchtime and in the evening before they go home. They make sure that um, instead of um, the children sitting down, con congregating together to have their lunch, they have their lunch outside because you're less likely to catch COVID if you're outside. Mm -hmm. They carry their lunch outside and they sit at distances from each other. Are, so are it's we possible. adopting that? And so we have, have asked the, for that? We, we've asked the Ministry of Education to come up with a with clear protocol in terms of how we can get our schools moving. Because uh, remember, education is so critical. Um, we can't afford to have a whole year lost because of COVID. So somehow we have to get get the schools to start going again. But okay, quickly, the, those the, policies. The last one. So the, the first one has to do with uh, vulnerable people. How do they get to work, etc. Well, we've op we're opening up the economy. We, our curfew now starts at 10 p.m. Uh, it doesn't start at 8 p.m. No, we allow shops. Yeah, she says those vulnerable, are there any plans for them because they still have to go to work? Yes, uh, I mean, they will, they will go to work. So what additional plans do you... Do you uh, I don't understand <laughs> that question in particular. <laughs> so what additional plans um, before COVID... Mm -hmm. uh, people with diabetes were going Precisely. to work. So what additional plan? Precisely. Uh, la la last one, um, and quickly, please, in less than 60 seconds. Uh, have we, is there any unique experience, lessons learned, you know, based on our experience? And then the World Health Organization has directed that if we must ease restrictions, we must implement strictly the use of, is it nose masks or face masks and all that? How are we, how are we going to do that? So we are working with the local uh, local uh, manufacturing industry. Uh, we've um, identified, I think, about six or seven uh, Nigerian companies, manufacturers that um, have undergone the st standard organization of Nigeria verification in terms of whether the quality of the face mask they are producing and the PPE is good enough or not. And uh, we hope to work with them to make sure that a lot of the procurement goes through the local manufacturers. So that will sort of uh, increase, improve the economy. Are you going to distribute uh, pro bono, free? Uh, so to Nigerians. Uh, we will we will continue to distribute PPE to those hospitals that need them most. We will continue to work with the manufacturers to make sure that face masks are easily available and affordable. But our frontline workers, whether they are in the health or the non-health sector, like the security agencies, will continue to be the priority for us when it comes to protecting protecting them from catching COVID. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. We cannot we cannot provide face masks. Uh, Claire, I don't know whether you're planning to manufacture face yeah, masks, yeah, but, but we, we can we, provide face masks to the whole population yeah, of Yeah, because they, they have the, the World Health Organization is say that if people must go out, especially areas where uh, social physical distancing might be difficult, you know, makes it mandatory for people to, to wear face masks. It's important, so. it's important, but uh, the, more, the more face masks we produce, the lower the cost and hopefully the easier it will be for people to afford it. And we will encourage employers especially, e employers mm -hmm. especially to make sure that their staff are assisted with face masks so that they protect themselves. All right, I'm Dr. Sani Ali, your National Coordinator, Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19. And of course, uh, Dr. Simon Magaji Agwale, Head Africa COVID-19 Vaccine Tax Team of the African Vaccine Manufacturing Initiative. You join me, me uh, from Maryland in US via Skype. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank both of you. Thank you so much for your time. And um, of course, Dr. Simon Agwale, I hope to see you when you get back to the country. <laughs> thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Sanyali, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Claire. Uh, and that's it on Late Edition this week. On behalf of my production crew, I'd like to thank you and do join us again same time next week. Bye-bye.